Andrew Komandowski, and welcome to Surviving Bad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration. Today we're asking the question, what is the cause of school violence? Researcher Dr. Douglas Gentile from Iowa State University joins us to shed light on the causes of school violence and why we are seeing an alarming uptick in violence, and what can be done to make our schools safer. Let's meet our guest, Dr. Gentile. Welcome to the show. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and the passion that drives you to these issues. <laughs> well, I'm a child psychologist. Yes, I know I look older, uh, but uh, you know I care what's healthy for kids, and violence is never healthy for kids. So I think that's that's enough uh, motivation for me. Now you've been studying this for a long time, and. And I know from our conversations that what seems to be surprising contemporary media, the schools, everybody else, is not surprising to you. You've seen this coming. And and it's also kind of like uh, there's not really a whole lot new. Uh, we're just seeing a lot of the things increased, uh, kind of like you know, put on a turbocharger. <laughs> but it's not because you know the human brain is somehow magically different now than it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago. And in, in the past years, you have often appeared as an expert witness in cases where children have been charged with violent crimes. And tell us a little bit about your role there and, and, and what kind of you weren't necessarily there to condemn them. You were there to enlighten people as to what some of these root causes are and how we might solve them. Yeah, well, each case is different, obviously, but generally, uh, I think when when a terrible uh, tragedy has occurred, the natural response is we want to understand why. And that's one of the great things about doing research in this area is we can start understanding the multiple layers of reasons why these things happen. And so in, in cases like the ones you're mentioning, uh, often I'm trying to figure out, you know, what went wrong? Could we have known this? Should we have known this? Were all the red flags there? In which case then is it really, you know, it's, it, if we know this certain child had lots of different risk factors, it's not really that child's fault in the way we normally think of fault <laughs> because there isn't one cause. So even the way you open this show is an error that whenever we, uh, there is say a school shooting, we go, what was the cause of this? Well, that question's already wrong. There's never a single cause. Mm -hmm. Humans are much more complicated than that. There are always multiple causes, different risk factors, different protective factors, and how they come together can actually make it very predictable knowing which children are going to be more aggressive than others. So now we are aware that population density has a tremendous impact on the amount of crime in a situation. So a larger school district, more crowded schools contribute to some factors. But lately we've seen rural areas and less population dense areas exhibit um, the symptoms of violence, you know, from, from horrific crimes to just a general increase in anxiety. And, and in a sense, what we've hearing from teachers, violence against teachers, where they're not attentive, where they're rebelling against them, they're not listening, a sense of raised anxiety. So it's no longer just where there's the most kids, it's happening everywhere as if somehow this strange virus is infecting all these kids of a certain age and amping them up. Can you shed some light on some of the things you've seen in the changes of, of youth behavior that have caused some of these increases over the last decade or so? Sure. Well, there's a lot in your question there. So let's unpack some of the pieces of it. Uh, one of the things uh, you mentioned is, you know, the different ways people can be aggressive. And unfortunately, you, like most people use the word violence to kind of cover all of it. <laughs> and, you know, researchers don't think of it that way. Uh, we talk about aggression and aggression is defined as any behavior. So that could be a physical behavior. That could be a verbal behavior. That could be a relational behavior that is intended to harm someone else. And if the victim knew about it, they would prefer not to be harmed. That's a nice clean definition actually. Uh, it, it means accidents aren't aggression. Acts of God are not aggression. 
uh, most sports, even when we talk about football, American football being a violent sport, it isn't violent. You're not actually trying to injure the other players. And if you do, you get thrown out. So, so we're talking about aggression broadly. There are lots of ways people can be aggressive. Violence, however, is one very specific narrow subtype. It's only physical and it's extreme, such that if successful, it would result in severe bodily damage or death. So when we're talking about youth and aggression, that covers a wide range of things. When we talk about youth violence, that's a very narrow slice of things and much harder to study because almost no one is violent. That's the interesting thing. Almost everyone is aggressive. <laughs> you say mean things to your friends. You, you are sarcastic with your partner. That's a form of aggression. Uh, but you are not likely to be shooting people up and down your street. So it's important that we recognize, you know, there's a very critical distinction between aggression, which is what most of us uh, study, and violence, which is what most of us hear about in the news. That's a great point. I'd like to return to that after the break. And after the short break, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Gentile. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. The black truck. Hey, Christina from accounting. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, I used to date a girl named Christina. Oh, really? Yeah, and then she dumped me for my best friend. You want to see some photos of them that I took? I don't. I thought we talked about this, buddy. Buzz and overshared again? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call a car. That's a smart idea. So, yeah, I know. That's why I did it. Hey, you're going to get back to the top of the mountain. Does that mean I'm going to get back with Christina? No. Oh. No, no. Welcome back to Surviving Bad. I'm your host, Peter Komandowski, and we're talking with Dr. Douglas Gentile of Iowa State University about school violence and aggression and unraveling a mystery where a positive change, less violent behavior may be possible. Dr. Gentile? Well, in our last segment, you mentioned an interesting word. You said it's kind of like a virus, and there are researchers who actually say that. Uh, Ral Huseman a uh, distinguished professor at University of Michigan, has been saying this for many years, that he says it is contagious, <laughs> that you can catch it from growing up in a family where you see it. You can catch it from seeing it in your neighborhood. You can catch it from seeing it in the media. That basically the way the human brain works is we learn just from seeing. Uh, that's why you're watching this show, right? Uh, you don't need to sit there and take notes. You will learn even if you're only half paying attention. Now, if you take notes, you'll, you'll learn better. <laughs> so we can do things to improve our learning, but even without trying, we learn. And so it's basically like a virus in the sense that as long as you come into contact with other people who exhibit the symptoms, you can catch it yourself. And the more people we come into contact with it, and the more ways we come into contact with it, the more likely it is that we'll catch it ourselves. I've never personally been all that big a fan of that way of thinking about it, um, but I don't think he's wrong. Uh, you know, I tend to think more in terms of risk and protective factors, uh, you know, which I can actually measure and quantify in numbers uh, rather than this more metaphorical approach. But it's a very valid way of thinking about it. So one of the ways we can reduce violence is start paying attention to all the places people come into contact with aggression or violence or these types of attitudes and try to minimize contact just the same way we did with COVID. We you know, kept more social distancing, we wore masks, we spent you know, less time in places where it was likely that we could come into contact with the problem. So in an era where the media has taken this drastic shift in a way, I, I, almost away from science and saying we need to be in the schools with protective factors, we need to teach uh, teachers to respond, it's all reactionary to the acts of violence. Now, we probably need some of that because we've already got to the point where violence is erupting at a higher rate than ever before. 
But in, as a complement to that, what do you think should be done in the schools to invest in a long-term solution to reduce aggression? Well, let's think about anti-bullying programs. Um, generally, uh, or in many cases at any rate, when a school provides an anti-bullying program, they perhaps bring all the kids down to the auditorium and they give a, a one hour presentation on why bullying is bad. Here's the interesting thing. No one in the audience thinks it's about them, right? The victims know it's not about them. They're the victims. The bystanders know it's not about them. They're bystanders. And even the bullies don't think it's about them. So who's learning? from this, uh, who's who's actually getting the benefit of these types of programs? And I'm not meaning to criticize you know, the, the work that goes into putting these programs on. It's certainly valid work. The issue is, are we delivering it to the people who need it most, who can actually benefit from it most and have you know, the biggest effect in your school? So I've mentioned that I like to think of uh, aggression in terms of risk and protective factors. And there are several ways we could, we could talk about this. So let me show you, uh, you know, one way that I sometimes like to consider it. So if we think about aggression as a thermometer, and it's not really a totally fair analogy, but down here at the uh, cold end, your children are always respectful and polite. And as it heats up, maybe they're a little bit rude or have some aggressive thoughts or start saying some unkind things. Maybe as it gets a little more toward the middle area, people start uh, behaving relationally aggressively, which is things like, you know, saying, I'm having a party and you're not invited or spreading rumors. Uh, turns out, in fact, those can be very damaging uh, because if I punch you, yeah, you get hurt, you get a bruise, but after a few days, the bruise is gone. If, however, I spread a rumor about you, that can last for years. As it heats up even more, maybe you start uh, having violent thoughts where you actually want to really injure people, and then maybe you start pushing and shoving and threatening it. Uh, and then only at the highest end do kids start actually trying to clearly damage each other using physical violence with fighting or potentially lethal violence. Now, no one risk factor. And for example, if you take the U.S. Surgeon General's report on youth violence, there are about 100 risk factors scientifically documented in that report. None of them can take a kid from the cold end and push them all the way to the top. No one is that strong. But once you start combining them, it becomes a bigger deal. So if we say, take the uh, shooters at Columbine High School, well, those kids uh, had uninvolved parents. So we might, you know, notch it up uh, another bit there. Those kids had psychiatric illnesses, you know, notch it up again. Those kids had been bullied, notch it up again. Those kids consumed lots of media violence. Now, which one of those broke the camel's back? no one of those. It is the combination of all of them that really matters. And so minimizing any one, if we can reduce bullying in the schools, that would be a real benefit. Now, how do we do that a little more effectively? I'll, uh, I can answer that in a few minutes. Thank you very much. After a short break, we're going to talk about children living in an adult world, the role of parents and teachers in the process of healing a generation that's been raised on a diet of fear and violence. Stay tuned, you don't want to miss this. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here, he's here. Wait, 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 what? I can't drive. What, what? My. Welcome back to Surviving Bad. We're talking with Dr. Gentile about growing up with more violence and aggression in the lives of children and what can be done to reverse the trend. Dr. Gentile? You know, when we think about 
the increase, and there certainly has been, if, uh, if we just look at, say, FBI data on uh, mass shootings, uh, it's an exponential increase over the past 20 years. And why is that? Well, again, there's no single cause. The fact that guns are much more available, the fact that the uh, attic rifle ban was allowed to expire, uh, the fact that uh, violence is much more available in the media now in your own bedroom, on your own phone <laughs> or tablet than it was 20 years ago. Uh, that we have you know, fewer and fewer resources for helping families in need and mental health. Uh, you know, so it's no one thing. It's, it's all of these things together. But if we think about this question of school shootings, a school shooter, that's actually not a real word, <laughs> right? That's a made up word. Uh, and yet we all know what that is. Well, why do we know what it is? And I don't like to blame the media about uh, for too much, but I think they share some of the blame here. That um, if we think back to say the Columbine High School shooting, those kids were put on the cover of Time Magazine, not once, not twice, three times. Who else gets to be on the cover of Time Magazine? The Dalai Lama, the president, <laughs> really important people. You've just made heroes out of them. And that's one of the things the Secret Service has noted is a risk factor for more school shootings is that they become very obsessed and learn about the previous school shootings. And we give them tons of information in the newspapers, the way we report it. We spend lots of time looking at what weapons they carried, how many rounds of ammunition, how did they plan it, what did they practice? Who should we know that? That's just teaching the next generation what to do better, how to get the new high score. And in fact, a lot of the school shooters who have been caught talk about how that was their goal. They wanted to be the best at this now. So the way we talk about it in the media, it's starting to change finally, where we're focusing more on the victims, we're focusing more on the families as they try to recover and the communities as they support each other. That shows the actual cost of the violence rather than doing this hero worshiping thing of talking about the shooters. Why it happened, actually, we don't need to know. The police need to know. The FBI needs to know. Forensics needs to know. But actually, the public, we don't need to know. We should actually be focusing on how can communities support each other after these events and so that the next one's much less likely. So, so looking at that, what do you think we should be doing in the schools. I mean, it's obviously not a single issue, so we have to look at it broadly. Um, is bullying something that is sort of like the precipitate of some of this uh, and on a broad level, or is it just one of many other factors? It is one of many other factors. However, it's a fairly strong risk factor, both for the bullies and for the victims, by the way. A lot of the people who perpetrate mass shootings feel that they were bullied. So if we had stopped the bullying previously, <laughs> that, that might have taken away that risk factor and made it much less likely. Um, so I have some data that I can show you about this. Here we have uh, you know, seven different risk factors that I measured in a, a longitudinal study with uh, children. And we're looking from beginning of the school year to whether they're uh, likely to get into physical fights later in the school year. Uh, and if these children see the world more as a hostile place, expect other people to be more aggressive, then as you can see, if, they're, if they have this, their risk is increased over not having this. If parents are more involved in their media habits, uh, they're at lower risk. If they like consuming media violence, uh, they're at higher risk. If they have been bullied, they are at higher risk. If they are boys, they are at higher risk. If they consume lots of media violence across multiple media, TV, movies, video games, that uh, almost doubles their risk. And if they've previously been involved in a fight, that's the strongest risk factor because of course the, the best risk factor uh, or the best predictor of future aggression is past aggression. Well, what happens is 
no one of these matters a whole lot. If you have zero risk factors, your risk of getting into a fight within the school year is low. If you have one, it doesn't go up much. If you have two, it doesn't go up much. You get to three and it seems to jump. You get out to having all seven and I have 94% accuracy predicting which children are likely to get into a fight this school year. I can't tell you which day, <laughs> but I can say within the school year. So what matters is the accumulation of risk. So how do we reduce it? Taking one away matters. Taking multiple ones away matter. Now, I mentioned, what if we wanted to use this approach to think about how to improve anti-bullying interventions? Well, if I just have four risk factors, I know whether you're a boy, whether you've been bullied, whether you've been involved in fights in the past, and you consume a lot of media violence, I have 85% accuracy predicting whether you're likely to get into a fight next year. What if I only know three things about you? You're a boy, you've been involved in fights, and you consume a lot of media violence. I still have 80% accuracy. What if instead of giving a bullying intervention to the entire school, we found these things out from the students and we targeted the intervention to go in and really work with the kids who are most at risk. And maybe that would be much more effective than we've been in the past. Those are great points. We're going to take a short break. And afterwards, we're going to ask Dr. Gentile to share some final comments, insights, and inspiration. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared. And you can be certain we'll keep your world connected. Surviving Bad, we're asking the question, what is the cause of school aggression and violence, and what can be done to reverse the trend? Let's see what insights and advice Dr. Gentile has to share. You know, we talked briefly, you're doing an innovative study with the Des Moines schools to try and learn more about this behavior and some of the root causes to help the counselors and the leaders at the schools. Tell us about that and anything else you'd like to add. Well, schools, you know, occupy a really interesting place. First of all, they get all the blame, and yet they have almost no control because, you know, what what kids are exposed to at home and and the family situation, you know, schools have no uh, no control over, and yet we keep thinking they're supposed to be the ones solving this problem, which is a very unfair position to put schools. So if we're going to try to put schools in that position, how do we give them the tools to do it? And the answer, I'm not going to be popular with this, is not more guns. Uh, the, the statistics on that are very clear that you put more guns in schools and more people get shot. Uh, I don't think that's really the way we want to be going. So how do we reduce the even need for the guns in the schools? And one way is with more information. So when schools have really good information on their kids, for example, I, I mentioned if we know which kids have been involved in fights in the past, if we know which kids feel like they've been bullied, uh, if we know uh, how kids are spending their time and if they have more aggressive attitudes, well, we could be doing different things with those kids. We could be helping them. If we had more counselors in schools to help the kids who are bu bullied, that could help them. So I think getting more information in schools is useful. And Des Moines Public Schools has been working with the Partnership for Healthy Iowa to try to implement a, uh, a school-wide survey trying to look at some of these risk factors so that we can do much more intelligent work with this, the children themselves. That's a great point. Um, you have other studies and research that you find fascinating that relate to this problem. <laughs> can you share some with us? Well, one done by my colleague Brad Bushman at Ohio State University did the most scary study I've ever seen. Uh, brought pairs of children into the lab. So you, you bring uh, your sibling or you bring a best friend in and they came in and two different studies. One was with uh, violent movies, one was with violent video games. 
he randomly assigned them to either watch uh, the same movie, but with, say, the guns edited out, uh, or play the same video game, either with no weapons or with swords or with, uh, with guns in it. And what was fascinating is then after playing the game or watching the movie, uh, he turned the pair of kids loose in a room where there were lots of interesting toys to play with, but hidden in the room was uh, an actual gun. And the question is, well, will the kids find the gun? And you know what? Of course they did. <laughs> in the uh, movie study, I'm showing you the data from that one, 72% found the gun. In the uh, video game study, 90% of the kids found the gun. Well, given all this emphasis on uh, you know, gun safety, every kid knows you're not supposed to touch it. You're supposed to go find uh, an adult to talk to, to uh, you know, you know, tell them about it. Did the children actually go tell the researchers? No, very few of them did. Uh, you know, forty-three percent, almost half of them who found it, picked it up. Well, did they just pick it up and put it back down? In general. Uh, if they had watched the movies without guns, they only spent 11 seconds holding it on average. But if they had seen guns in the movie, it was a five times increase in their time holding it. Well, what did they do with it? Well, here's the terrifying thing. If they had watched the movies with guns, they pointed the gun at their friend, sibling, or themselves and pulled the trigger. It's true both, again, for the movies as well as for the study with violent video games. If they had played with a weapon, they were much more likely to pull the trigger, pointing it at their best friend, their brother or sister, or themselves. Terrifying study. I thank you so much for sharing this information and your work on behalf of Iowans to reduce aggression and violence in the schools. We look forward to more updates on what you're doing. And thank you all for joining us today. Check out our website, ahealthyiowa.org, and keep your eye on Mediacom MC22 for our next episode of Surviving Bad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration. On Mediacom MC22, your local programming leader.